Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I warned you, today uh, is Sanctity of Life Human Sunday. And uh, I warned you a couple weeks ago that we would be coming to this Sunday, and maybe you thought I was going to tell you about that the AFC and NFC finals are today, so this needs to be quick, or no, but in truth, today as we come together and as we think of the sanctity of human life, we're reminded of why life is sacred, why it is a gift from God. And as we come together today, perhaps you're scratching your head and wondering to yourself, just a little bit, wondering, well, why are we talking about it here? Why would we bring up a political issue right here in church? Shouldn't that be something left for the political pundits? Shouldn't that be a discussion that's left out of this church? Church is meant for the good news, right? Well, certainly that is true. But let's take a few moments today to just consider what life means to our God. See, we don't look at life as precious because a child is cute, because a child is wonderful. We don't look at life as precious because we care a lot for someone. In fact, the reason we look at life as precious is because all life is a gift from God. All life is precious to God. All life has come from our Lord. And when we have texts like our psalm for today, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, knit together in the womb, or a text from Mark chapter 10, we're forced to look for a moment at some of those life issues that are going on outside of the church. Some of those issues that are happening in our society today. Do such that are regularly in the news or regularly on our Christian mind is abortion and euthanasia or mercy killings as they dub it. So why in church though? Why talk about this now? Did you realize that yesterday marked the 38th anniversary of Roe v. Wade? Yesterday marked the day that abortion became legal in the United States, and since then, over 50 million infants have been slaughtered. But let's look at what life is. Let's look at life before our God. Let's consider for a moment who life is, who we are in our God's hand. Well, as we think of it, we're drawn to Psalm 139. And at the very first part, we have, we are knit together that he formed us in the womb. But even before being formed in the womb, we are already being knit together. Believe it or not, at the very time of conception, already just in that connection of man and woman, already in that God had determined that we were, whether we were going to be male or female. He determined whether we were going to be short or tall, whether we were going to be wide or skinny, or whether we were going to be smart or enable to be good at math or good at science or good at basketball. All that before we've already entered into the womb. Can you believe it? Knit together. Before we ever e our parents ever even knew we existed. And even before our mothers knew we were there. God had already given us the cells that we needed. He'd already de designed us so much so that we knew we needed that connection through, the, through our through the umbilical cord to our Lord, to our mother. Our Lord had already made us who we are. See, oftentimes, when we look at those cells, when we look at those little people, people, the scientists say, well, it's not a human being. It doesn't yet have thoughts and feelings. The thing is, already before we're ever in the womb, God has already made us someone. Not something, but someone. God has already made us who we are. Wow. It's hard to believe that before we ever even realize it, before even our parents realize it, that God has already put us together. That He's already begun designing us in such a way that we couldn't even imagine. And as he takes his hands to form us in the womb, we're reminded back to Genesis of how he first put the human beings together. He drew that sand together on the ground and he breathed his very breath of life into it. It wasn't just like the other animals. 
It wasn't just like a soulless being that was drawn, that God spoke into existence, but he took the time with humans to push that sand together, to form it, to take it up in his hand, and to breathe his life into us. Then there was man. And then from Adam's side with his hands again, in a very intimate way, he took from the side of man a rib, and he literally built Eve. He literally put her together. To me, I cannot imagine the complexity, the design that God has made. Even scientists, doctors, they they don't completely understand this complexity of God's wonderful creation in humans. But we know that that each of us is God's creation. We know that each of us were uniquely and wonderfully made, that he knit each of us together. Just consider the words of the psalmist. Psalm 139, 14, he said, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My my soul knows it full well. Do you see, in God's eyes, life is important. The value of human life is not in what we do, what we say, who we are, but it is in the fact that God made us, that God formed each one of us, that God in His hands put us together. Now when we start to consider our value system though, how do we value life? How does our world value life? When we start to consider how the world has values life, it's on what our accomplishments are, aren't they? If you're going to receive a promotion at work, It's on your accomplishments. If you're going to get an A in class, it's on your accomplishments. If you're going to be the best at a sport, it's on your accomplishments. But that's not God's scale. God's scale is not on our accomplishments, but it's already in the worth that He made us. But you can see what happens when we start to value life by the scale. When we start to put life in our perspective, on our value system, when we stop putting it in God's system and start looking at it as our own, just look at what has happened. Look at how we've begun to treat life. We've started to talk about mercy killings. We've started to talk about dying is a good deed. Killing is caring. Certainly not. Certainly not. God is not a God of death. He is a God of life. But these are the slogans that are used. These are the encouragements. Well, if you're not worth it anymore, it'd be better for you to go be with your Savior. No. Never. God created us. And He values us whether we're six months old, whether we're ten years old, whether we're 20 years old, God values us even if we are sitting in a wheelchair and not able to move from that wheelchair. God still values each one of us. Even if we are in a coma, God values each one of us. Even if we are not a contributing member of society, God values us. And when we start to get our values out of priority, when we start to look at human life just by accomplishments and what a person does or doesn't do, We miss the beautiful picture that we are of value of God because He designed us and formed us. Because He put us together. He uniquely made each one of us. Matthew talks about Jesus knowing how the count of hairs on our head. A God who cares enough to number our hairs. A God who cares enough to know us so intimately, more intimately than our spouse knows us, more intimately than our best friend knows us. God knows us. And when we value life by accomplishment or by deed, we're sinning against God. It's not just a matter of our political position. It's not just a matter of a social agenda because that's certainly not what the church is pushing. The church stands up for life. The church stands up for life because who else would? No one else stands up for life because there's no reason to without knowing the rest of the story. But sometimes the church remains quiet. 
Sometimes the church stands on the sidelines and shares in the shame and the blame of 3,200 lives. 3,200 lives already this year. Proverbs reminds us, Solomon tells us that we are to speak up for those who cannot. In Proverbs 31, he says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. When we do not stand up for life, who will? When we do not stand up for human life, no one else will because like I said, they don't know the rest of the story. They don't know that, the, that life not only was created by God, but that God continues to sustain it each day. They don't know that each life is so precious to God that Jesus came down into this world and gave His life. That He died on the cross for each one of us. That He lived this, on this earth, humbling Himself so that we could live with God in heaven. As a church, we need to stand up for those who cannot. We are called to defend those who cannot. And like Jesus in our gospel lesson for today, the church needs to be indignant. Just hear Jesus' words again. Let the children come unto me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And when we don't talk about those issues, we're not allowing for those children, for those older adults, for those with mental handicaps to receive the gift of God's blessed gospel. We're not allowing for them to receive that precious word of forgiveness. Every child, every child who is aborted is a child who is not able to be raised in the church, is, it not a, ch is a child who is not able to be baptized, and a child who we don't know what happens to. When we think of our gospel lesson, we're often reminded of those children who God calls each to Himself. We're reminded that each of us need to have that faith like a child, but also that we're all helpless like those children. Not one of us could do anything to save ourselves. Not one of us could stand up for ourselves and defend ourselves. Not one of us could even crawl into the arms of our Lord, except for the fact that Christ reached out to each one of us, that He drew us in, that He took hold of each one of us, and He carried us into His Father's house. On the last day, when we join our Lord, when we join our Savior, Christ will pick us up. He will lead us through those gates. It will not be because of what we do or something we have said or done, but because Christ has already done all of it for us. When we look at our value system, there is nothing we can do. There is no reason for our salvation. There is no reason for our lives. But when we look at our God, when we see His love for us, we cannot help but know that we are His children. We cannot help but know that His hands still continue to lead and guide us. Sometimes, sometimes in the church, we do make that strong stance. We do make that fervent stance for children. And sometimes we alienate those who have had an abortion. The thing is, each of those people who have had an abortion are also the children of God. Each of those people are not outside of God's blessings, are not outside of God's grace. We may think, look at that as a heinous sin, and certainly the murder of a child is. But God also sees them as someone who is in need, someone who is helpless, someone who is hopeless, someone who needs His salvation. There's a young lady who I think illustrates this point very well. She anonymously wrote a letter to the Lutheran Life Center in Iowa. She said, I never realized that Jesus Christ was willing 
to get down into my muck and my miry life and lift me up out of the sewage of my problems. He has since shown me He really is. And not only is He willing, but He has already. He has already entered into our world, entered into our sewage-filled, our garbage-filled lives, and He has redeemed us. He has washed us and made us clean. He has washed us and made us whiter than snow. He has come into our, our lives to make us His own. The reason we observe Sanctity of Life Sunday, the reason we take time in church to talk about this important issue is because it is God's heart that we talk about. It is God's mind that we, sh- that we, that we remember as we think of each person who is aborted, who is told dying is a duty. Each of those people are precious to God. Each of us is precious to God. Never, never lose sight of the fact that you are a child of God. Never lose sight of the fact that God sent His Son for each one of you. Never lose sight of the fact that each day Christ continues to come for you, to lead you to repentance, to lead you to forgiveness, to lead you back to Him. Never forget that there's a reason you are still on this earth. See, even if you are six months old like Nicholas Cross, or if you're going to be a hundred years old like Ruby Lehman, or if you're anywhere in between, God is using you. God is still sees you as His precious child. And never forget that. Never forget that you are the Lord's. And never forget the beautiful truth that He came into this world to claim you as His own. That you were worth it to Him. To come down, to die on a cross for sins He didn't commit, but to pay the price for sins we did commit. Never forget that you are sons and daughters of God. Let us pray. O Christ, we do thank and praise You that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We thank and praise You that You have designed us beyond all complexion on this earth, that You have put us together in ways that we could never imagine. Lord, we thank You that You have called us Your own, and that we were worthy of You dying on the cross for us. We thank You, Lord, that You have loved us. May our love for You never cease. May it never be quenched. Lord Jesus, we pray that we may stand firm And hold fast the truth that all are precious to you. That all are your children. Lord, give us a spirit. A spirit of willingness to go out. To share that message. That no matter what you have done, no matter who you are. That you are worth it to God. That we are worth it to him. This we pray in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.